Hello, thank you for joining us and welcome to CTF Live. My name is Robert Jones and I'll be your host. This is the first in our series of CTF Live events that will take place through 2020. Each will focus on a different aspect of digital construction. Our aim is to build a practical, informative set of webinars that discuss opportunities, challenges, benefits, etc., within the industry. We start the series looking at digital construction and remote working, the new normal, how construction giants are using technology to manage impact and operations. We have a truly international panel over the coming hour joining us from around the world. In Australia, we have Greg Conlon, Chief Digital and Development Officer at KBR. In the UK, Giles Price, Chief Technical Officer for Europe, Middle East and Africa at ACOM. Also in the UK, Felipe Manzatucci, Director of Digitalization at Skanska. In the US, Keith Churchill, Construction Technology and Innovation Head at Bechtel. Here in the UAE, we have Najib Dalank, Head of IT at Alec. And finally, joining us from Greece, we have Arif Boualwan, Senior Manager for Digital Transformation and Strategy at CCC. Now, the pandemic is forcing new ways of working brought about through governments and to an extent companies around the world trying to slow the spread of COVID-19. A common theme has been to encourage employees to work remotely where possible. We've, we've all heard the messages of stay at home, work from home, you know, avoid unnecessary travel. But what about in the construction industry? There are functions and roles that we know can be done remotely, but ultimately people still need to get on site. So this webinar is going to explore the role technology will play in minimizing risks and enhancing operations. We'll start by looking at the new normal as it is today. And Greg, I'll start with you. So what are the tasks, roles, functions that you're finding are now being done remotely that traditionally would not have been? And as each of you answer, actually, could you give us a brief insight into how COVID-19 has affected your affected current operations within your markets as well? Greg, over to you. Thank you, Robert. Um, so KBR has a significant business in China and South Korea. So we were really engaged quite early in the pandemic and, and as a result, you know, really it forced us to respond early and respond uh, efficiently. And we've seen a significant change in the way we've worked. We've found our customers very engaging. And in broad terms, I, I would uh, talk in a few categories. The home office or project roles that KBR delivers have moved almost entirely to home. More than 90% of our home office staff are completing their uh, their day-to-day -day activities from home. Uh, we achieved that in a couple of weeks and we stabilised the productivity inside a month. If you then talk about the actual construction workforce, you can imagine the conversations were a little more binary in that some customers stopped their projects or slowed their projects. But we have managed to migrate a significant amount of our indirect staff away from site. And we're really managing to run our sites with a much thinner back-to-back -back, um, team and really ch challenged now not to, not to probably deliver, but to maintain good productivity, good safety and good, uh, uh, a good level of enthusiasm, you know, after people have got through the initial crisis period. I think the one other piece that I would put with that is in the background, the digital systems have really had to step in. You know, our most strategic customers were a long way down that journey. Some of our customers weren't, but I would say, you know, the power of the digital platforms, the cloud computing, the distributed technology has really enabled this just to happen in a matter of days and weeks. Whereas in, you know, a few years ago, this would have created a complete delay or complete hysteresis in the industry. Yeah, and I think actually, Felipe, if we move to you and the same question, I mean, that's something that I think we are seeing is, an industry that has quite often been, where it's quite often been said that it's slow to adopt technology has been anything but. So again, for you, what kind of roles and functions are you finding? Are now Certainly. Being taken board? Yeah, thank you, Rob. Yeah, I think um, similar to what Greg was saying uh, regarding KBR, Skanska is a global company. And um, what we have noticed is that, um, you know, different um, geographies, 
uh, COVID-19 has had a different impact to our operations. Uh, up in the Nordex, um, we've been able to maintain high levels of productivity because of the uh, temporary legislation in terms of social distancing and so on uh, is far more relaxed than what it is, for example, in Central Europe, the UK and the United States. So um, we, the approach we've taken has been very much uh, based on geographies rather than a global approach, uh, but we're still being able to share the best practice across, uh, across the globe. UK in specific, uh, I agree with you, Rob. Um, our industry has always been seen as um, lack, lagging behind when it comes to uh, um, adoption of technology. And um, I must admit, uh, because of this, uh, it very much feels like a, a fire in an already burning platform that um, our sites and our productivity is suffering uh, significantly because of COVID-19. And uh, this has meant that we have to accelerate the way in which we um, adopt and deploy technology in our construction sites. We have now realized that um, doing so is bringing big, big changes and big improvements to the way in which we work uh, on our construction sites. So um, we, it, it is similar to, to Greg, I suppose, uh, we have been able to manage working from home. Um, our core offices are closed and we're not thinking of going back until uh, much later in the year. Uh, in a way, we're actually rethinking the use of office space. Um, we have now learned and realized that it's a different way of doing things. So very much in this stage, Rob, where we are beginning to think about what the new normal uh, looks like. What will Skanska look like um, towards the end of the year? What will the industry look like towards the end of the year? So we're building a number of scenarios and uh, start planning towards those. It, it certainly is exciting times, Rob. It certainly is. Um, <laughs> it's unfortunate to say, but you know, uh, because of this, a lot of good things are coming uh, coming out of this um, pandemic. But um, the construction is definitely picking up the pace now when it comes to technology. So, so Giles, are you um, do do you think that there are a lot of rapid learnings happening at the moment from from the way you've had to change your operations as well? I mean, similar to Felipe and, and Greg. Yeah, very much so. And it's been amazing the amount of pace that we've been able to apply and how quickly that we've been able to adapt um, to sort of, you know, a whole new way of working, moving on to our cloud based systems. Um, you know, we had an initiative in place being sort of over a year now for freedom to grow, to allow people to work productively in the way that best suits them and best suits the circumstances. So similar to Greg, you know, with over 90 90 percent plus of our of our people working remotely, working smarter. Um, we're also training thousands of people um, to use new tools and to move from 2D to 3D. And we've been able to do that at a much a quicker pace than we perhaps wouldn't have done without a sort of crisis scenario in, in front of us. Um, and of course, on-site work that has its own separate challenges that we're, we're managing day by day, keep everybody safe. And I, I think actually that's a really good point that Giles has just made, Keith, which is um, a lot of this has been talked about for quite a long time, but actually now something has happened, which is kind of pushing it through faster. And I guess that's what you're finding as well. Yeah, yes, absolutely. You know, uh, we, we operate in a lot of business lines, similar to a lot of the companies within this call. And um, what we've seen is adoption of different technologies and pockets throughout our company. And what we're seeing is those pockets have come, you know, into the limelight and we've been able to leverage um, the work that we've been able to do in some industries very quickly, uh, whether it's remote working, remote inspections and, and other, as, you know, and other uh, applications like that. So it's been really encouraging to see, you know, some of the groundwork and foundational work that we've done in the past to be able to be leveraged to, uh, to, to become very quickly embraced by, by other aspects of the, of the company. Um, when we're talking about the safety of our employees and we're talking about, you know, delivering for our clients, I don't think that, you know, this is, this is not the way we've done it in the past, or this is not how, you know, that's just how they do it in, in the comms business line, or that's just how they do it in oil and gas. 
that doesn't apply anymore. Everybody's coming together and uniting on, on some of these applications and, and really taking it to the next level. And it's been really encouraging um, to see that the, the groundwork that we've laid is, is paying, paying dividends here. Is it? I guess is is that something that both I mean Najib and and, and Arif I want to move on to to um, looking at some specific examples but I think as you answer it's probably worth again just giving us a uh, an insight into what you're seeing on the ground as well so if I start with you Najib um, now we we when I when I spoke to you uh, earlier this week you were talking about some of the cloud migration that uh, Alec did last year to support remote working so what did you do and, and what sort of learnings are you finding and did how did they help you prepare for the current situation yeah thank you Rob uh, yeah at Alec we we had Porter here in UAE and we predominantly work in, in UAE business uh, for Alec it was quite fortunate and to, to adopt the cloud journey uh, relatively early. We have successfully migrated uh, uh, all our data center and infrastructure to the cloud last year. Okay, And in addition to that, we were able to accommodate the situation to support remote working and business continuity relatively easy to other companies. Because as an example, if I can give you the pandemic situation, once it came to disrupt the transportation and the global supply chain, we were still able to scale our IT infrastructure relatively very easy using the cloud. And we were also, although we were using digital technologies before, uh, like Microsoft Teams, SharePoint, and, and OneDrive, but we were lacking the slow user adoption in terms of using these technologies. Mm -hmm. What we have found during this situation that it was quite advanced for us that user adoption were picking up and we were like enabling a seamless migration to support remote users. In addition to that, at this stage, we're sitting with more than 700 employees working remotely, more than 1,200 active daily users on Microsoft Teams and around like they are collaboratively uh, working together using these tools. In addition to that, we have enabled virtual desktops for all our employees using different kind of uh, uh, virtual desktops in the cloud. And in addition to uh, uh, Microsoft Direct Access in order to enable secure connection to their documents and data as if they are working directly from their offices. And this is what supported the pandemic situation during this stage and supported remote working for all our employees during this situation. Well, I mean, you mentioned there uh, something like a thousand employees using collaborative software. Did you, were there kind of cultural uh, challenges to overcome to, to encourage people to really start embracing this? Yeah, so as I mentioned, Rob, we were like struggling to have a user adoption before this situation. The situation helped us a lot in order to adopt these collaborative tools. And the mind shift has totally changed during this situation. There was a force for everyone to use this collaborative tool in order to engage with other employees and the clients and subcontractors. So there was a huge need. And the training that has been done virtually provided its benefit. And the spike in utilization that we have seen is quite very well as, as, as compared prior to this situation. Okay, so Arif, now you're, you're in Greece where we're seeing you know, news stories that the country reacted very quickly, has started to come out of uh, lockdown. However, as a company, CCC, I know you don't really operate in Greece, although you have a headquarters there. So again, I think it would be good to get that, that kind of update of what you're seeing. But also, I know that you're looking at uh, technologies such as sensors in helmets. So you're looking at how you could use these for site safety, how you can look at how you can use them for contact tra tracking. Could you give us some insight there, please? Uh, indeed, Rob. Uh, to be honest, we're very impressed with what uh, the Greek government is doing here. It's clearly an outlier uh, in Europe even. Uh, when you see the numbers in Greece, uh, you're talking about less than 20 a day compared to thousands in other places. So we're lucky enough to uh, to have a proper leadership in place to take uh, early measures when it comes to Greece. When it comes to CDC, 
uh, um, I wouldn't repeat the good ideas that came and the measures that uh, were implemented because many of what was said were already implementing. Let me focus on the question that you asked me uh, about the helmet and the sensors. Probably you're talking, uh, uh, Rob, about uh, Wake Up. Uh, so um, partnering with Wake Up and uh, many other uh, startups we have like 15 startups in our portfolio, uh, like in Dubai, in Dubai talking about Imansa Lab and manufacturing and more than 10 in the region, has been at the heart of CCC uh, uh, strategy in order to bridge the gap between uh, very traditional industry, like, like the construction and emerging technologies uh, and futuristic one. It's no wonder, Rob, that the construction industry has, is one of the least digitized uh, compared to all other industries. The productivity norms of the construction industry hasn't improved in the last 50 years, unlike automotive manufacturing, etc. So we created this uh, uh, portfolio of CC to partner with startup to bring that technology in place, uh, 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 pilot it on our project, uh, support uh, the domain level expertise to the pilot, to the startup, to bridge the gap of knowledge, and test it on large scale. When it comes to uh, IoT workforce, which this falls under, and we're also experimenting other technology like bracelets, like facial recognition, etc., the objective was never uh, uh, related to uh, COVID-19 because it started before COVID-19. It really started as first and foremost for safety, to improve the safety. Uh, we want to bring everybody back home uh, safe. Of course, we use it as well for to improve attendance, and we're trying to link it to our back-end project controls uh, application to improve activity, etc. But you know Rob very well, big data, the beauty of big data, you store data for one thing, you use it for another thing. So now we have the data, okay, on a few sites, uh, luckily. So the challenge now, and the time to you, how can you use this data for social distancing, for contact tracking, et cetera, et cetera, in order to protect the livelihood of our employees, yet maintaining our operation and delivering what's expected from us uh, to our clients as far as project and construction, but definitely, Rob, at a very high cost at our end. That's and, really the, yeah. I mean, you're, you're part of the European Union as well. So, again, I, I don't know how much of your, your, your work is in the European Union, but are you having to think about the data protection laws there as well when you've got, got, got the data? Very, 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 very good question, Rob. We have affiliated companies in the European Union, but not at CC. Uh, most of our operations are in the Gulf region, and the Caspian region, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, etc., and Africa, North Africa. This is the traditional areas. We have project. We had project in Australia, in Queensland, etc. Uh, we don't operate as CCC construction in in, in, the, in Europe. Nevertheless, the GDPR, very good. Uh, the question you raised applies to all European, even if they're outside Europe. So we have to, given that we we have offices here, we have to implement GDPR. If you're a European, Rob, and you're in Dubai then whoever deals with you has to respect GDPR. So yes, we, we, uh, we have uh, uh, taken all measures to protect the personal uh, privacy of our labor and workforce when it comes to IoT. And that's a big challenge, believe me. Okay, and Najib, I think if I remember correctly, you have also been working on uh, contact tracing uh, applications. That's correct? Yes, it's correct, Rob. So the situation has forced everyone to step out from their comfort zone. And uh, at Alec, we were like fortunate in UAE also that the construction was considered a critical sector and the government allowed to continue operating in this sector uh, along with extra health and safety measures. And once we got this direction from the government, we wanted to guarantee safety for all employees. And in order to do that, there was an urgent requirement to develop an app where we need to trace all COVID-19 confirmed cases at Alec and provide it to the health and safety team with the primary information for all staff and laborers. The app mainly helps us to trace all our employees' private direct contacts, either from uh, the HR module, from the camps module, from the meeting they attend on uh, during the last two days, or their uh, movement and travel history along with their health symptoms that we capture on a daily basis. So in summary, the app was designed to track the whole process from the time a case is suspected by raising a questionnaire on a daily basis, undergoing a COVID-19 test, uh, getting the test results, quarantine status, and getting then receiving the clear status that yes, this employee can resume work. So the whole process helped us to better trace COVID-19 cases across all project sites and camps, and it allowed a better decision-making from the 
top management in order to handle situations and in order to limit the spread of virus between, between employees. Uh, along that, the app was uh, accompanied by a Power BI dashboard where it visually displays this data by status and by project in order to provide a quick insights and in order to provide better decision making. Now, in addition to that, we have installed thermal cameras across all our camps, head office and project sites in order to screen all EPs that they are going to project sites. And earlier this year, we have successfully implemented facial recognition in order to automatically identify employees through video streams. At this stage, we are integrating the facial recognition solution with thermal cameras in order to identify suspected uh, COVID-19 symptoms directly and, and uh, reporting these cases directly uh, to site administrators. Okay. I think there's an awful lot there that you're doing. Uh, I think we could spend a lot of time going through. So uh, I think we'll come back and explore some of that a little bit later. But first of all, I just want to move to Greg. Um, now, KBR, a lot of your work is in the energy sector and there's a lot offshore as well, which must make it very hard to maintain things like the distancing guidelines. So what sort of technologies are you exploring so that you can, again, look at monitoring and, and maintaining safety? Yeah, thanks, Robert. <clears throat> so I guess as we've transformed KBR over the last four or five years, a much larger percentage of our business is actually in the government and defence sector, uh, 60 or 70 percent these days. But if I talk about energy for a moment, um, or, or what was traditionally called oil and gas, I guess we've seen a couple of particular issues. Um, probably the most acute has been offshore because you can imagine when you've got people bunking offshore and you've got to maintain separation distances, all of a sudden people can't have the same density in their accommodation blocks, the same density on the platforms. And we've really seen customers have to either slow down or reschedule offshore maintenance and offshore activities until they can be confident they can manage the, you know, the, the safety, the pure safety and uh, I guess hygiene of the individuals. We'd already, if I switch to onshore oil and gas, we'd, I mean, geofencing has been around for a long time. We'd started to move towards individual location tracking, um, typically, you know, using uh, sensors that people carry with them for gas monitoring and other tasks, a bit like the helmet example that CCC gave. Um, and we'd really done that primarily for safety to help know where people were, keep the right supervision ratios, make sure the work areas were actually being managed effectively. But, you know, I think uh, Arif made a good point there. Once you've got the data, you can use it for other things. And, you know, you start managing productivity and, and understanding where your workforce is. And what we're now doing is, and, you know, it's trialling, I won't say it's proven, we're now looking at using that GPS or, or mobile phone-based data to actually work out the proximity of individuals and be able to retrospectively trace if, a, you know, if an individual which has COVID-19, where they've been and who they came close to. Now, that's nowhere near uh, proven, but you know, we've certainly got the ability to do it, and now it's purely a data management challenge. And I guess the comment I'd make is we're seeing that accelerate on mobile phone apps, and you're seeing various governments, including where I live, Australia, use a mobile phone app to, to start you know, tracking... Uh, tracking and tracing COVID-19, that software, that functionality is going to be very, very transferable. The only question is what device carries it? Is it a helmet? You know, is it a gas sensor? Is it a mobile phone? How do we do it in a hazardous area and make sure that we meet all the regulations and requirements? Okay, so you're actually seeing this as a technology that, that could be used going forwards in the future in, in multiple ways then? Absolutely. And I think, you know, like, like all data, once you collect it, there's multiple uses for it. So, you know, the big, the big challenge here always has been, you know, getting people comfortable with collecting the data. But, you know, we all walk around with our mobile phones and our uh, Fitbits and, and, you know, Microsoft and Google collect all that data. So COVID-19 is giving us a little bit more ability for people to understand that the real benefit of, of managing this data is keeping them safe and keeping them healthy and, and keeping the workforce productive so that we have a, an industry that actually, you know, is going to survive into the future. 
Okay, great. So Felipe, um, today is, is kind of like a big Wednesday for the UK when, <laughs> when a lot of you are, are allowed now to, to kind of leave your homes and the, the lockdown is being eased. Uh, again, I've heard the government talking about wanting to encourage construction and construction workers to, to, to move back on site. So what are you at Skanska doing to tackle the challenges and, and how are you using technology to, to do this? Yeah, sure. Uh, it is certainly a big Wednesday here today. Um, we, we, first of all, we do welcome the, the move by the government to encourage construction sites to, um, to increase the, 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 the number of sites we reopen and to um, increase productivity from those sites. I think that's nothing but healthy for the economy and healthy for the, uh, the supply chain that works with us. The, um, in terms of the challenges we're encountering, uh, mainly the one that we're still um, really, really struggling with, uh, or working on rather, is social distancing. Um, there's a two meter rule in the UK. And um, so there's the limitations as to what, um, well, that two meter rule, you cannot work in close proximity to a colleague. So that's causing um, a lot of, well, it's making us think about how we overcome that issue. And, and the impact it's having on us basically is uh, transporting people to site. So um, we're using technology to uh, support us in becoming better at managing people moving uh, from and to a site. So we use, um, for example, ge geographical information systems, GIS platforms, to know at any given point where our supply chain is, where the materials are coming from, where the workforce is, so we can coordinate um, a group movement of the personnel going to sites in a way that we can still um, adhere to the new uh, legislation. Uh, within the sites, uh, we uh, that's like you've been hearing uh, across the, the, the table here, the, the panel, um, we use um, proximity applications, uh, distancing apps to ensure that individuals know when they're getting too close to each other and we're able to demonstrate compliance with this two meter rule. Uh, we're working on shifts as well, making sure there's a deep cleaning uh, process uh, in between shifts to make sure that there's no um, cross contamination. Um, uh, we do that through digital timesheets uh, so it's basically, um, it, it works in an Office 365 platform. That's something I want, uh, I want to share as well, Rob, is that all the technology we're deploying right now uh, is technology that is available. Uh, we're not creating anything new. We're not developing new tools or new uh, gadgets. This is stuff that we're getting off the shelf. We're just making the most of it, making it work for us. So in this okay. instance, we're using... Sorry. Which allows you to move faster, I guess, as well. Absolutely, absolutely, Rob, absolutely. And I can say that the, the initial point we're making about accelerating the, um, the digitalization of our operations, uh, it really is happening at a faster pace now. So uh, we use digital timesheets, it's an Office 365 based um, platform that allows us to be a lot more um, direct, a lot more transparent with how we manage our workforce on, on sites. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a plethora of other things we use in terms of site progress reports. We use 360 cameras, uh, drones where possible, uh, anything that we can do to remove people from site. So uh, our, we have three, a three-point approach. Can we do the work off-site and can we keep people off-site? That's the first point. If we cannot, then can we at least have as many tasks done off-site as possible? And the last resort is we will tackle the activity on-site with people on-site. So... Um, that, that's it. That's the kind of three-pronged uh, uh, approach that we're taking in the business. We're in a good place because we we already have a good platform based in in our in our business. Uh, we have, uh, like you've been hearing in the panel as well, cloud-based um, systems, which are really uh, coming uh, alive now. They're really approving uh, their their worth in this situation. Okay, and and Keith, now Keith, you and I, I I've seen you speak before, and we've spoken before, and I know that you are a big proponent of things such as sensors and have, have certainly looked at how you can use IoT and sensors uh, to, to improve um, things such as materials flow in construction. I also know you're, 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 you've been looking at things like crowdsourcing and how this could be used. Could you give us that kind of insight on what your early findings are 
why were you doing it? What kind of tangible benefits ha has it given you? No, absolutely. Um, one of the greatest things about the construction industry and, and working for a company like Bechtel or any of the companies that are online today is that we've always been problem solvers. We're always, you know, finding new and, 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 and different ways of, of accomplishing goals. Um, one of the things that has really been at the core of our acceleration of, of technology adoption and innovation within the company has been has been crowdsourcing. And what we've found is is that crowdsourcing is an easy way to identify um, what's important to people, uh, what people have passion have passion about, um, what they're what they're looking to 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 do, and what they what they've seen. Um, you know, I don't think that there's one group. Uh, for that, you know, within the companies on, on anybody that's that's on the call that that has all of the answers. So, you know, with the ability to go out and 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 reach everybody in the company and give everybody in the company an opportunity to have a voice, we found that that's a, a really powerful approach to one, you know, identifying problems. Um, but in this particular case, everybody knows the problem. Uh, and, and, and then, you know, finding solutions in, in varying ways and in varying approaches um, to, to establish a, a path forward. And what we, what we found and, and, and a lot of what's been discussed here was brought up when we, when we, when we approached the subject, one of our projects was, was at full stop and we needed to find a way to meet the government's requirements to go back to work in terms of social distancing, uh, minimization of craft density, um, cleanliness and, and all of those. And, and it's a, it's a very public project. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, publicity around the conditions at site and, 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 you know, there was a lot of critique around whether we were ready to go back to work. And so we opened the question up to the entire company and we got overwhelming responses. And what we were able to do was analyze those responses with the project, um, identify there were certain things that were identified as, as just immediate go-dos. Um, so we just not, you know, notched them up and, 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 and sent Tiger teams out to, uh, to go and, and change the setups on site. You know, some of those involved like no touch solutions for uh, faucets or, or soap dispensers or hand sanitizers, um, all the way to using AI uh, for various applications and analyzing our plans, understanding how we're packaging our work, um, using remote operations. You know, how can we how can we minimize how can we maximize productivity by minimizing you know, the transfer of documents, the transfer of tools and, and the transfer of the, of the virus. So um, we felt like it was an extremely successful operation. We really, uh, you know, we really have uh, gained <clears throat> a huge amount of insight over the years through the use of crowdsourcing and it's, and it's, it's come through in a huge way um, in developing solutions for COVID. So, th so this is literally, you're going to, to everybody within Bechtel and, and, asking them for their ideas and seeing which ones are most popular or most are most doable, I suppose. Well, I think, I think it's a range, right? I think it's, it, it, it varies from, you know, this is something that we can go do right now that's off the shelf that we can implement now. And then there's others that are you know, pie in the sky, but it's a great, fantastic idea. You know, some of the things that we saw for disinfecting um, areas were, were extremely innovative in terms of using robotics and ultraviolet lights and, um, and, and other means for, for ensuring cleanliness around the project um, all while we were working. So, I mean, it, it, it was a wide range. And so, yeah, we did have to evaluate them on, okay, which ones can we implement now to get the project back to work? And which ones do we need to take a further, you know, you know a, uh, a, a further deep dive into to establish a path forward? You know, we don't know when this is going to end. So some of these technologies could really bear Bear, you know, become fruitful um, after, you know, a, a certain time to test and implement. Okay, thank you. So, Giles, I think, you know, Keith is right. We don't know when this is going to end. So for ACOM, you must be, again, you are, again, you're, you're looking at um, how you change your working practices. How do you interact with clients differently? So could you give us some insight into some of the ideas and some of the things you're trying to do, especially if you've got some examples where you're working with clients differently as well? Yeah, no, absolutely. And as Keith rightfully says, we don't, we don't know when the end point is. So effectively there's the here and now and the, and, and the immediate things that we've put in place. And then there's the medium term, which we I'd probably argue we're sort of into now as lockdown starts to ease, um, you know, across the globe. 
Um, and obviously then there's a longer term, you know, what, what does the future look like? Um, and it, it, you're right, that, that applies not only to us um, as, as effectively service providers, but it also applies to our clients and how we help them. Um, we, we've taken a sort of a global view um, and the, the reason for that is that as lockdown has eased and as indeed the, the, the virus spread, we can share learning from country to country, region to region. Um, in terms of our customers, I think what's really important is that we, we use our technologies, we use our ideas. And what I would say is not only is everyone on this, on this panel very open, I, I found the industry as a whole has been very open in helping each other, um, let's say less protective um, from a commercial perspective than perhaps they may otherwise be. So, you know, we're grabbing all of that best practice. Some of those things are off the shelf ideas and solutions because we need them now, but others are what, what we might want, what could be helpful in six months, nine months time. And that's where our innovation um, and creativity plays out within our business. But not only plays out for us internally, but also our clients. So uh, the use of VR, the use of digital twins, the use of scenario planning. Um, that you know, there, there's industries. Aviation is a good example that you know is pretty much closed down, with the exception of cargo. So how how do we help our our, our clients within the aviation industry think about the future? And that's all of those tools come to help them. And again, they're, they're reaching out for help and support. Um, and we're, we're keen to provide that. Um, but as I say, it's it's very collaborative world at the moment. And you do find that in a sort of crisis scenario that, you know, people are sympathetic, people are willing to help each other, perhaps in a way that they never have before. Um, and that's what we're doing. We're embracing that. Um, and as I say, we've got pipeline of, you know, good practices going on now, um, ideas from people on this panel across industry and also from our own innovation tools. We've, we've got a Global Challenge 20, which um, is, is in place within an, uh, our, our global business. We've got something else called Mind Blazer that's looking at sort of quick win, quicker ideas that we can, we can get to the marketplace. And, you know, we're, 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 Are you we're finding not... people are giving lots of ideas there and, and that you expect to see some tangible benefits come out of those? Yes, absolutely. There's, there's lots of people knocking on the door with uh, the, the will to help one another. Um, so we're, we're embracing that. There's some great ideas out there. As I say, some are, some are to be used now. Um, some need some development for the future, whatever the future may look like. And I think helping people sort of think about what that future may be is, 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 is a big challenge for everybody. Yeah. And I, actually, by sheer coincidence, this morning I was having a chat with somebody um, and we were talking about digital twins and how how they would become more important uh, in future. And from there, we started straying on to other areas that technology could be used within within the built environment and looking at things like monitoring air quality, mo monitoring, um, you know, you know mon monitoring, uh, even monitoring the the temperature of people as they're moving through the building. That's something I guess you see coming through. Absolutely. And it goes back to the early points around, there's a lot of data out there. Like, how do we capture that? How do we use that? How do we bundle it together? Um, how, how do we manage that amount of, of, of data? Mm. And there's all those different points. As you say, if you just take, um, if, if we took a typical uh, office location in, in London, for example, and you look at the, complications of uh, bringing people back into that type of environment um, and what you do what you need to do to eliminate risk but where you can't eliminate how you do you protect people from that risk how do you manage around it and data is you know fundamental in us being able to do that and it the same applies to sites as well construction sites and other types of sites exactly the same approach so you know what, what does that look like in 12 months 18 months 24 months not sure um, but there's a huge amount of work going on in the industry at the moment to, to understand that better than we currently do today. But I think what we have demonstrated, as, as we've heard on this panel, is, you know, the workforce over 90 percent typically have learned to work smartly and remotely and maintain productivity. Um, and if you had asked people, was that possible six months ago? I think you probably get the answer. Don't think so. 
but actually it's been done it's happened yeah and arif i mean you're also looking at things a bit differently as well and i know that you've been looking at things like um repurposing shipping containers creating yep. plug-in intensive <coughs> care. so could you tell us what you're looking at there how you're planning to use it and, and where you think that will go in future you know what you're learning yeah are from. yeah rob uh, you're talking about what we call the cura project it's basically falls at the heart of our corporate social responsibility uh, and commitments to the communities where we operate it more represents, you know, CC is family owned, it more represents the family values. Besides what I talked about earlier, that uh, our prime uh, objective at the moment is to protect the livelihood of uh, uh, our, our workforce and uh, run our projects smoothly. Also, we have commitments toward the communities where we operate. So how could we, what we could do different? We thought of three different approaches. First, direct uh, interfere, interfering and, and donation that we did for so many countries. Like in Greece, we donated many ICUs to the governments from Kazakhstan to Jordan, Egypt, name it, Palestine, Lebanon, and many countries in the region. We uh, donated more than 60,000 uh, testing kits for Corona uh, per country. And then we, uh, we, uh, we even ventilators uh, to, uh, to many countries we donated. So this was direct donation as part of our CSR philosophy. But we thought, what could we do different? And this is your question, Dr. Paul. Uh, we are a contractor. We're part of, uh, um, uh, we're partner of the World Economic Forum. So we have the access of the whole ecosystem and this is where the Cura project came. And at the same time, we have past experience successfully build many hospitals. And we have the team who has the knowledge in, 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 in constructing hospitals. But we thought it's not about constructing. You know, with the peak, uh, Rob, now uh, during the peak, uh, the peak moves from one country to another. And uh, the name of the game is how many ICU units as a government is, uh, can be provided. So from each 100 people, as per the WHO organization, 20% 20 20 needs uh, hospitalization and 4.5% needs uh, uh, to be an ICU. So it's the capacity. We ask ourselves the question, and the Cura project was the answer. How can, what can we build? Something mobile, uh, uh, fast to manufacture, easy to deploy, and scalable ICU unit. So the Cura project talks about converting shipping container 40 inch shipping containers, 40 uh, foot sorry, uh, uh, shipping containers into two bed IC unit following open standards. And uh, it's a non nonprofit organization. And of course, adhering to the standards of COVID-19 ICU uh, uh, configuration. So we started uh, 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 working on that. And now uh, our partner in, in Italy, and we're finishing one in the Gulf region, uh, the two pro first prototype in Italy and in the Gulf region will be hopefully finalized very soon. Uh, we're talking about uh, hopefully end of May, we'll at least have one of them. And as soon as uh, uh, this is successful, we'll look at ways, how can we scale this up and support governments by moving, relocating hundreds, if not thousands of these ICU units from one country to another, depending where the peak is. And that, that, that's, the, the, that, that's the beauty of, uh, of this approach. So also, given that uh, we had this from as being partner of the uh, World Economic Forum, also we thought third dimension of our commitment. How can we do different on the world arena? Okay, so with the World Economic Forum and the World Health Organization and, and, and uh, another thousand uh, uh, com uh, companies and leaders in the world, we have launched what's called COVID-19 Action Platform and under the umbrella of the World, Health, uh, uh, World Economic Forum, uh, which basically talks about galvanizing global business communities uh, for collective action. Although unless everybody's safe, nobody's safe, Rob, we see countries competing. We see a government it's, it's, uh, trying to uh, 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 utilize the, the crisis, unfortunately, in some places to, to make, uh, uh, to be more popular. So we, what we're trying to do is to bridge the gap between public and private sector and uh, uh, to, to promote collaboration and sharing knowledge. And had we not been part of this group, we wouldn't have learned about this open standard that is done by a MIT professor, the, the, uh, the Cura project. So I wouldn't have been engaged with many other players to, to, to successfully do that. So this is basically, if I, if I answered your question uh, correctly, this is basically the objective behind the Cura project. And we, we're really looking forward to succeed here because that would be a big Im uh, impact and help we provide to governments in the region, in the Gulf region, uh, should this succeed. And we, we, we're pretty much sure it will succeed. So, so actually, that's for, to, to an extent, what you're talking about is, is similar to what uh, Giles was just talking about, which is that there are competitivenesses 
that are being parked right now and collaboration is 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 rising in certain areas to try and help with this situation and you know you'll go back to being competitors when you need to elsewhere i want to move on a little bit about uh, innovation and how do you get the investment but before i do i have a question i just want to ask felipe um because Scanska, I know, are very big on things like digital twins. And again, Giles was actually just uh, highlighting digital twins and how, how potentially they could be used. Mm -hmm. And just while I was listening and talking, it did make me think about, are you looking at um, how you could pot potentially use these differently? So rather than just using them to sense the health of the heavy assets within a building, you know, the, the parts, you can use it to also monitor the people in a building differently. Is, is that something that's possible? Uh, absolutely, it is possible, and it's something we uh, uh, already do. Um, we have very much, uh, from the outset, we have our customers' um, uh, benefit in mind. So uh, it's important to, for the customer, if it's an office space, for example, in, in central London, to learn and to understand their asset the best way they can. and. Um, one of those aspects is, is my asset being used at its full potential? So uh, we do have sensors. Uh, we partner up with a number of SMEs, uh, experts in sensors, and um, they can tell the occupation levels of a given uh, office uh, space. So we're able to um, allow the customer, or our customer, to learn about how their assets are being used. Uh, is it hitting too high? Uh, are the windows always open? Uh, the occup occupancy levels uh, within the office space. And um, we enable our customer to have visibility of this, um, of this data. Uh, therefore, they're able to realize that, well, actually, I don't need two floor, uh, two floor of office space in this uh, building. I can do with one if I can be clever around uh, hot desking, for example. So um, these insights from data is absolutely critical uh, for our customers' success. And this is a way in which we use digital twins to give that information back to the customer. So you're right, it's not just about the building in itself, the condition and the operation of heavy plant, but it's about how the office is being used by the actual, um, by, by human, by, by people, by actual end users of that asset. Okay, thank you. Um... So moving on to the to the investment side. So um, Giles, I'm going to ask this, but I'll start with Greg first. The there's lots of really interesting ideas coming through. Some of them are off the shelf. Some of them, I think, sound like they are technologies that were being planned or in development anyway. But we're in a period where cash flow is being heavily managed. So where extra investment is needed. You know, there has to be an ROI, there has to be a, a, a real benefit. How, how are companies trying to, or how do people try and convince their boards that these investments are worthwhile? So I'll start with Greg and then the same question to Jobs. Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. I've probably answered the question in a few parts. Um, you know, the most immediate um, impact has been, you know, health and welfare of our, our workforce workforce first of all and of course you know to be honest price is secondary to keeping people safe and healthy so we've been able to simply you know get great collaboration with customers to make sure everyone goes to work and comes home to their families you know safe and sound i think the next piece of the puzzle which you've heard us all talk to is there was massive barriers to utilizing tools and systems that were already available and you know things like we're doing today on Zoom and MS Teams and all these other products. In the past, we all needed to do six and 12 month assessment programs and make sure it was all going to work. Well, guess what? We've just done it. And so I think, I think what we're actually seeing is quite a different culture emerging. And we're actively engaging a lot of our customers about how to reimagine the future in terms of initially their work places and their work practices but as soon as you do have that conversation in a meaningful way you realize the leadership style has to change and once you start leading differently and leveraging data and leveraging these tools I think it's a different 
conversation and the returns are different. That said, you know, how are we going to get the innovation funded is a very difficult question. You know, I think the, the scale of COVID-19, the impact financially is going to, well, we know it will be massive and there will be winners and there will be losers. I think the point Arif made is quite interesting though. Ultimately, governments and the private sector are going to collaborate to get industry restarted, to get employment restarted. So whether it's infrastructure problem programs across the US, whether it's you know, green energy solutions in Japan or Australia, you'll see a lot more collaboration, I think, to make sure the industry doesn't actually stop. And so I think in the short term, the answer is funding the innovation will probably be a bipartisan solution. You'll see governments and stimulus packages help fund the bill. But, you know, we, we especially on the government side of our business, we have a lot of engagement with the governments. And I can tell you, I've already been on phone calls like or video conferences like this, where they've said, we're not paying the whole bill. We'll, we'll help fund getting the technology off the ground. We'll help get the systems in place. And, you know, whether it's a cloud system, whether it's a common data environment, the governments see the value of the data and then they'll say to the private company or the, you know, the oil company, right, now, if you really want to get the benefit of the investment, you know, we've opened the door, now you come through it, please. And so I guess I really see that, that sort of two-speed process of initially, you know, we can just sweep through and pick up the low-hanging fruit that we should have been doing anyway, but we all found reasons not to. Then we're going to have to actually get together with government and industry and say, what are the industries of the future? What are the projects of the future? And how do we unlock the potential? Otherwise, you know, we face a very, very long and extended financial depression. So Giles, do you, do you agree it's, it's public and private sectors working together, picking off the low hanging fruit and then, and then looking at how bigger projects can, or technology projects can be collaboratively uh, funded and used. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree more with what, what Greg has just said there. Um, I think I'd start also by saying we can't afford not to invest. And perhaps now's the time to be bolder than we perhaps would have been in the past. And, you know, some interesting McKinsey research on that subject that says, actually, it is a time to be bold, innovate, creative, um, and look at, look at your business model and how it moves forward. And we, we've certainly not stopped doing that as a consequence of where we are now. We continue to look at, at what's going on, what's best, talk to our clients, what their needs are, what they now think their future needs are. Um, and there's things also, you know, without, um, obviously it's, it's not innovative in the context of today's world, but if you look at modular, modular buildings and the modular approach to construction, and you just step back and think, well, actually, I can do it more productively, safer, more cost effectively, with better quality and better sustainability. So, you know, it, it's, it's moving up the agenda and that's done over the last 10 years. But perhaps now there's a springboard that says, actually, this unlocks so much. So innovation and certainly, you know, with time to be bold, but also let's look at some of the things we've been relatively slowly trying to push forward in the industry and just think, well, what have we achieved in the last three months in this situation? Let's actually look back at some of those ideas and go, do you know what? Let's just push the boundaries now. Um, and I'd say modular, modular is a good example of that. Well, that's a very interesting point you're making there. And although I, I realize that we're here talking about digital technologies, but I think that what you're saying is very interesting because you know, you, you move towards modular, it's a bit more of a manufacturing style approach to, to the construction. Um, but it also means that you need to have, um, I think, fewer, fewer changes going on all the time and, and more of a, a defined kind of contract of what is required. So that's very interesting that we will see that happening in, 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 in certainly in the Gulf region. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Obviously, you know, it, it can, it's underpinned by digitalization as well. It just lends itself to go hand in hand. So I think, you know, a, a good example. But I think we'll, by nature of what we're facing now, tomorrow, next month, 
six months down the line and beyond, that actually being a bit bolder, being more collaborative is going to give us a better result. And I think, you know, be it UK PLC, you know, continental Europe PLC, you know, global PLC, we have no other option. Mm. Yeah, indeed. And it'll be very interesting, actually, in the Gulf to see how that, that, that rolls out. Um, so, so a lot of these innovations are be done, being done out of necessity of the situation. So I think, you know, Keith and Felipe, I, I want to move to you now. Um, I'll start with Keith. How do companies plan and implement a digital strategy that can be rolled into future projects? What needs to be considered? Um, I think, I mean, this is also a good question and I, I, I really commend, uh, you know, uh, Greg and Giles for, for their discussion around, around how things are being adopted and how to collaborate because I think that that's really an important aspect of this because it's, if you don't get the opportunity to try things in, a, in an expedited manner and you have, to, you have to wait for the next project or wait for the next project in order to try new things, that's really what's been driving our, our slow adoption. So now we've got this springboard to be able to enable projects to say, hey, come try this. And, and, and we're, we're being successful in certain applications and that's going to drive more success in other applications. And I think that as we see um, adoption in, in this, in this COVID-related activities, why can't we apply that to changing the specifications or changing the approach to the other projects? Um, from, a, from a digital strategy perspective, I really believe that, uh, you know, when we're, when we're taking a look at the new um, applications that we're implementing now, don't forget to, to manage and, and, and keep the data, keep, have an understanding of the KPIs that you need to be monitoring in order to decouple uh, the digital solution from, you know, that we're implementing today that, that is COVID related um, and, 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 and really have an understanding of the benefit that, benefits that it provides from a productivity perspective, uh, from a, a quality and safety perspective, um, in order to be able to communicate those, you know, to those board members that you discussed earlier, um, in order to, you know, if, if, if this does end and we do go back to normal, you know, a lot of these technologies we were looking at prior to uh, the outbreak. And so I think that it's just really important to be able to, to say, these are the benefits that it provides, that these applications provide as it relates to limiting the spread of a pandemic. But these are the, these are the benefits that it provides from a business perspective. And these, these benefits have always been there. And, and, and like a lot of people on this call have said, you know, it's, we've been slow to adopt. We're adopting these now. There's no reason to regress, you know, if this if this ends and there's no reason not to continue if it doesn't just based on the fact that, you know, for an easy example, people have been able to be as productive or more productive remotely um, just just because of, of the systems that we have in place and their ability to communicate, to visualize and to uh, to operate in, in this in this in this in this way. And, and so I just I truly believe that as we move forward. Um, we need to make sure that we're, 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 we're establishing the business cases and we're proving those business cases quickly um, in order to, to, you know, keep these as a foundational piece of the industry moving forward. Okay. And, and Felipe, same, same question for you. I, I, I happen to agree with um, what the panelists uh, have been saying, Rob. Um, I think the, the original the first part of your question is around um, innovation and at this specific time of uh, C-19 pandemic. And um, I, I think I, I make the point of saying that although in, all the construction industry has always been seen as uh, maybe not a, a much of an innovator because of the amount of R&D funding that can be put into it, uh, we, haven't, we have not, not done it. So uh, as an industry, we have been very uh, creative, very uh, innovative, with um, new ways of construction. And um, so I think a key thing that we, we ought to take forward from what we've learned in this instance is that open collaboration, that um, innovation should be now a strong and really, you know, <laughs> in pen written in our agendas going forward for business plans, because really is the only way to actually move the industry forward and find solutions to problems that affect all of us. Uh, we're all in the same, we all have the same challenges. We're all scratching our heads to find the same uh, solutions to the same problems. So open collaboration really is a key thing to take forward. From a digital point of view, um, a, a digital strategy, I, I think you'll find that 
all construction companies nowadays have one. And the key thing uh, about a digital strategy is making sure that you become a, a data genius. Uh, you have to have a, a data platform that allows you to, you know, through API connectivity, as you know, we were hearing from the panelists, to have the ability to manage and understand that data that we're producing every every second of our operations. So um, a, a number of papers have been written around dark data and um, we did analysis and 85% of the data uh, in the UK construction uh, sector is dark as in we don't know even exists. So the ability from a, a, any construction company to be able to capture that data and really understand what it's telling us, you really understand um, ourselves, how we operate, how we perform as a business based on that data, not based on, you know, perception or, you know, gut feel. That is absolutely essential for any construction company going forward with digital strategy. Okay, so I think uh, we'll move on to uh, audience questions next, but because I can see we've got a lot of questions, but before I do, just one, one final question I'm going to ask for Arif and Najib, and that is, we started by talking about the new norm as the current situation is. How do you envisage the new norm <coughs> for the construction sector in the coming year or so as we start to emerge from this, or in terms of technology scenarios? So Arif and then, and then Najib. Yeah, well, Rob, we've been dreaming for quite some time of uh, a digitized construction industry, which sounded more like a myth than reality. We worked, uh, probably all the gentlemen here worked on 2050 vision, and I don't know what, which sounded, which would have been realized maybe in 2500 20, 20, rather than 2050. Uh, uh, with COVID-19 now, I'm sure from the amazing idea we heard today, everybody has created, everybody has created kind of war room to tackle the crisis, to ensure they uh, protect the livelihood of their staff, uh, operate our project, uh, local community commitment, etc. Nevertheless, what we did in CC is to create a parallel group with 22 uh, experts and uh, brilliant engineers uh, to look post COVID-19, uh, how the, what, what will we do, what difference will do. Besides, of course, remote working uh, 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 and many other things, traveling less, uh, the obvious benefit of uh, 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 of COVID-19, post-COVID-19, we are revisiting all the studies that were done earlier. And one of them we did uh, with many leaders in the world, the 2050 vision for the construction and different scenarios, which folded into three, which we think now it's at least it will be either realized by 2050 or even before. To be honest, before COVID-19, I thought it, it was a myth, uh, which can be divided into three. One, build, building a virtual world, uh, a construction run by uh, virtual reality, AI, robotics, etc. Second, which might be both, not either or, uh, more what we call factory runs the world, uh, prefabrication, modularization, everything happens in a, in a climate control area and protected. And then the, the role of a contractor is more assembly, like a, like a puzzle. And third, I think, Rob, it's most important. We, sh we should not let COVID-19 make us forget it. COVID-19 is a very bad pandemic, but it's gonna, not going to kill humanity. What will kill humanity if we don't do a collective, collaborative, action towards environment. If we forget our commitment to United Nations 17 global goal, especially sustainability. So more than ever with COVID-19 and post COVID-19, we should look at technologies to reduce CO2 footprint in the construction sector, which we are unfortunately one of the highest contributor uh, in the world uh, to the sector. So sustainability and, green, and, and, and a greener world, uh, what I like to close with today, Rob. Thank you. Okay, and Najib. Yep. Uh, look, Rob, uh, this situation is considered a wake-up call for all companies, especially in the construction industry, which was considered among the least digitized industries, uh, according to McKinsey. Uh, companies now need to refocus and uh, instead of focusing on the daily operation needs and try to invest more in digital technologies, and it showed a huge benefit during this crisis. In addition to that, uh, the pandemic has forced us to look and introduce digital technologies which weren't considered before in the construction industry. And it showed that the user adoption for such digital technologies has a high pace during this situation, which allow us to move forward in terms of adopting these digital technologies. If you look at the uh, typical IT spend in terms of innovation and IT software, 
globally was 1.2, around 1.2% of the total revenue. Now this percentage will change according to incorporate new digital advancements post COVID-19. And among the digital technologies, I think most panelists nailed most of the items, but I would like to add that there will be heavy utilization on RPA, robotics process automation, in order to eliminate uh, lots of repetitive daily tasks. Uh, video and audio conferencing will replace the physical meeting. It showed a huge benefit during this crisis and it will continue the new norm post COVID-19 situation. Mobility solutions will become the norm to digitize all physical and paper-based processes on project sites. And of course, AI IoT will be the new frontier in the construction industry. As the technology will mature, we will see huge leverage for these two technologies across different construction sectors. I would like just to add the final thought. If you look at the digital transformation framework, we have four digital accelerators. The first one is people and organization. And I think this pandemic situation has switched people mindset to adopt digital technologies. The second aspect is technology. And we can see now lots of digital technologies will be adopted by all companies and even in the construction. With all these digital technologies, we will have construction industry uh, as data rich and we need a way to analyze this data business intelligence and data analytics will be a third component and the third one is the ecosystem there will be a heavy collaboration among all construction stakeholders in order to overcome this situation but also find alternative ways for revenue streams for the future and this is where everybody needs to look for long term rather than short term. So at this stage, I think all companies are busy doing the short term analysis and overcoming the situation by implementing quick wins. But we also need to look as part of the digital strategy for long term resilience and look for alternative revenue streams. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that very detailed answer. So we have a lot of questions. We'll get through as many of them as we can. Um, if, if you feel the question is right for you, please just just say so and, and, and answer. The first one I can see here um, actually might be good for you, Keith, because I know you've done some work in something similar to this, uh, which is what are the digital expectations from suppliers, particularly still? Are you seeking to be able to trace, uh, I guess they mean materials, all the way through to the construction site? Um. Yes. So, so you know, we've been working in this space for for almost a decade, and 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 we've 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 tested different applications. You know, whether it's it's from you know an RFID tag, uh, you know, QR codes. There's different ways of of, of maintaining that traceability, and I I, I think that um, you know we are we are moving towards a a more digital um, industry overall, which includes our suppliers, it includes our contractors, and so you know the the way that we're reframing our specifications, the way that we're reframing our T's and C's and the, the purchase orders are, 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 are starting to trickle down to suppliers, our main suppliers, um, but then they have to trickle down to, to sub, sub suppliers and sub sub suppliers, which has been traditionally uh, difficult to, to penetrate, I guess, historically in the industry um, and to get that visibility through, uh, through, those, through those levels. And we're seeing uh, really good results um, in terms of progress reporting, in terms of material traceability, um, and understanding you know where our materials are, are are being sourced, how they're being fabricated, what uh, are are they within tolerance? Are we are we getting more feedback on that in order to provide our job sites um, with a with a product that requires uh, you know less installation activity um, and obviously less rework. Okay. Okay, um, got a question here, which I feel that we've sort of answered, but maybe it's worth just answering, you know, just reiterating again, which is um, how do you justify the cost of digitalization at this time when we know contracts, contract values are, are tight even before COVID-19 hit? And, you know, how does your company take that loss in the short term? You know, it's, it's, uh, the cost of challenge is always uh, uh, a factor, uh, it's, but it's beyond, uh, beyond cost. The, the challenge of implementing new technology is because of the risk of implementing that technology. So unless all stakeholders, starting with the uh, developer or the owner of the uh, infrastructure project, 
uh, to the uh, consultant engineering construction unless everybody share have a shared risk management methodology when it comes to uh, uh, implementing new technology the construction sector will not be disrupted so cost is one element you can always find way around cost uh, uh, but what you can find way about the risk inherited by implementing a disruptive technology on construction which should be shared by all stakeholders this what this would be my point okay and then i have a, there's a couple of questions here i'm going to combine actually uh so what technology are you using to conduct remote inspections and then there's another one which is sort of related but not exactly which i think we can answer at the same time which is what's been the most uh the single most successful or useful technology that has aided operations in the current climate it's interesting because I, I would have combined the two questions as well uh and mainly because uh we use drone technology quite a lot um to do um progress uh, surveys so we can actually see how much the project has progressed uh, against a timeline against a program so um we actually uh, fly drones and have a photogrammetry uh, we can through ai we can actually capture uh, change in volume in, uh, in earthworks for example so we can actually uh, link it directly back to a, a 4d uh, model where it tells us you know how much progress has been made we had this technology beforehand we've been you know using this we deployed this technology last year uh, in all our projects and the interesting thing is that that is the one thing that really is proving um, really successful in this period of time, because it's the one thing that has not changed at all. And it really proves the point. There's a lot of questions there, Rob, around how do you prove ROI? How do you get your stakeholders you know, to support the investment? Well, there it is. We're now showing something that took us about two years to really get into the business, to really get you know, people backing this, this, this uh, technology they can now see the return of that investment. They can now see that we, were not, we have not been disrupted because of uh, COVID on that specific uh, item. So the really um, how you put it across, how you sell the idea to um, the budget holders is absolutely very important. There's many, many examples worldwide, and you just heard it here in the panel, where you can use case studies to demonstrate how those solutions really have uh, brought really good, um, well, a good return of investment. So, um, so that, that, that's one of the items that we, we have noticed has worked really well. Drone technology, uh, we've got people driving, driving, um, flying drones on site with an operator at home checking progress, uh, which is almost like uh, science fiction. Yeah, I mean, Philippe, I completely agree, and maybe let me just add the the reverse of that. So, um, because of the drone technology, particularly in our government business, we do a lot of remote mission control, including mission control on the uh, International Space Station. And the really interesting thing is when you go to fix someone's medical conditions on the space station, you need essentially a whole series of tools, but the person actually puts the cameras on and looks at themselves and the doctor sits, you know, back on planet Earth solving the problem. What's actually happening now when people can't travel is, is customers are saying, is that technology available? And you can actually say, it's been available for 10 years. You just have to want to use it. And Keith, it's really your point, right? It's not a case of, is it impossible? No, it's actually quite possible. Is the data uh, constraints or difficulty very high? not really it's just a decision and you know maybe it costs a few thousand dollars for a hollow lens too or some fancy tool but you know it's it's almost more at the decision than than the technology that's the uh, that's the blocker have you found any of you have you found uh, uh an activity that surprised you how well it's been able to how successful you've been able to be by being off-site that you didn't know you could do before COVID. So that's another question that's come through. And I guess it's kind of related. You, you mentioned Felipe drones, but are there any other things that people have found very successfully operating that they didn't expect? I, th I, th I think one for me is just the, um, the, the virtual meetings that we, we all attend. And, you know, we've been able to facilitate workshops with 40, 50 people on board, including our clients. 
we just wouldn't have done that before. It would have been much more face to face. So some of what we might think today is quite basic and a part of our everyday life at the moment. Um, it wasn't like that three months ago. So I think, you know, just those tools have been really effective. And we're, we're still all learning, aren't we? We're still all learning through this. We mustn't forget that. You know, just how do we conduct these types of panel discussions? How do we carry out, a, you know, a performance review on a one-to-one -one with one of our team members? How do we get, you know, three or four different clients on a, on a workshop, which is involving 40 or 50 people? Um, and, you know, we're learning. We're not perfect, but we've come a huge way in, in, in well, the last couple of months. Unbelievable. Yeah, kind of along the same lines there um, with the remote uh, discussions, we, we've been leveraging uh, video conferencing for vendor discussions and, and implementing, uh, you know, walking through the step-by-step -step process in order for startup and commissioning of certain equipment, um, which has been a hugely beneficial for us, especially when you can't travel and you've got projects that are going to continue moving forward. Just having that ability to use you know, a real wear device or a, or a uh, camera that's integrated into some, uh, into your uh, safety glasses to be able to, 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 to speak hands-free uh, to somebody that may be in Germany or Italy um, from one of our suppliers and, and to be able to move forward with, uh, with the startup and commissioning activities without that vendor actually having to be present has, has really proven to be invaluable to us uh, in, in being able to deliver for our customers. So that's, that's another one from our side. And, we, and Keith, I think the point there is separating the complexity from the communication, um, you know, because you, you traditionally try and bring the complicated tasks together in the meeting. And what you're doing is letting the complication stay at either end and just have a simple uh, tunnel between it or pipeline. And we've found exactly the same thing with our large design centres. We've actually moved the majority of our teams in India and Mexico to home. And you would say traditionally you can't do complex digital twin modeling from home. The truth is the hardware stayed in the, the office and all people are doing is running the interface to their hardware at home. So you're effectively running your menu or your screen remotely. Your hardware never moved. Besides the good idea that uh, we heard, Rob, uh, I strongly believe that the biggest change is the message, the very strong change management message that was sent out there. For whoever uh, uh, resists the change, it shows everyone that when, when we have to do things, we'll find a way. When we have to survive, we'll find a way to survive. I think yeah. this, this will be a start of a big, long change for the construction industry. Uh, 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 we were, this this mindset shift I think is, is of the biggest value. Mm. Well, it's interesting you say that actually, because uh, there's a question here and it possibly is related to uh, the news that came through today about Twitter saying that they would allow employees to permanently work from home if their jobs were not, if they were not required to be on site to be able to successfully do their role. And somebody is asking, are any of you considering uh, allowing employees to permanently work from home or is this going to be a taboo uh, notion. Uh, the, the question, do they want to do that? <laughs> we tried the last two or three months. <laughs> to be honest, it's, it's, it's healthy up to a certain limit. And it's, uh, yes, we will be considering SEC, but it's healthy up to a certain limit, not permanently. That's my opinion. On the psychology aspect, I mean. So somebody has asked, can you elaborate more on the operating model for drone usage? I can elaborate a bit more on that. So I, I was giving, uh, I was establishing three steps to follow to, to make that uh, model work. And um, uh, well, I don't know who exactly uh, asked the question, but uh, uh, the answer is there. So the, th the first step really is to get um, a, a certified and approved uh, suppliers or um, yeah, uh, specialist who, who can provide that service to us. You have to have certain permits, you have to demonstrate that you are um, security cleared, that kind of thing. And uh, so that's a key thing, just to get your, your partners on board. Uh, again, we're not going to achieve this ourselves. We have to do it, you know, working in collaboration. So that's the very first step you have to do is to look around who, who you have around you that can actually provide that service. Uh, the second step is you must have a very clear statement, uh, problem statement. Uh, so what, why are you using drones? What, what are you trying to achieve? What really is the benefit in, in bringing that technology into the business? 
Uh, are you doing it because it's fancy and it's cool? Uh, well, it might not actually uh, go down well with the um, budget holder. So that really be clear about the problem statement. What were you trying to solve? And the third step is to have an IT infrastructure and capability in terms of knowing what, you look, what, knowing what you're doing with that technology. Uh, that must be in place before you can actually um, uh, deploy this technology. And the most important thing, the operating model must be driven as policy. Uh, it, it, if you allow for projects to use as case studies and to take on, you know, oh, well, I might use it, I might not use it. Uh, you start looking at variance of uh, performance in projects, which uh, in a construction company, as we all like agree, we hate. We want to see consistency. We want to see everyone working on the same operating platform, operating model. So make it policy. Really push hard for it if you believe that drone technology can bring benefits to your business. How will the pandemic change BIM usage, accelerate it, motivate clients to pay the money, the extra cost to actually use BIM in their projects. So if somebody could take that, please. Yeah, perhaps I start, Robert. Yeah, very good question. And yes, the simple answer is it accelerates um, as we move sort of 2D world to 3D world and beyond the 3D world. So being able to um, be smarter in our design and our approaches, being able to be smarter in terms of how we relate that to our clients is ever more important. And what I would add as well, um, and we've not particularly touched on this, is in, in the challenges that we're all facing day to day at the moment, just remember quality is an absolute priority for us. Just think about the, the quality management and how we do that in a virtual remote world. And, and BIM plays its part in that as well. So the use of, of BIM and making sure we've got the right quality management process and procedures in place and all the checks and balances, checking in with people that otherwise would be tapping you on the shoulder in the office and obviously they can't, um, and, and making sure that people do have access to those tools and are performing everything in line with your quality procedures is absolutely critical. But we've certainly seen our, our use of BIM move significantly in the, in the last couple of months. And but but will, will clients be prepared to spend the extra money that it will take to be able to use BIM on a project? <coughs> I'm not sure. This price I'm not, win environment. Yeah, I, I'd probably argue, is it any more money? Okay. You know, I you, agree, guys. I agree. If you, if, you, if you take the waste, if you take the lean approach and you take the waste out of the system, it at least is a neutral balance, if not more cost effective and more productive. So I'd suggest actually it reduces their cost, it reduces their risk. If time permits, Rob, I'd like to add something here to what Gil said. Yeah. Okay, it's uh, 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 definitely, I thought like you Gil, about uh, uh, BIM by its own drives efficiency. And with a struggling economy like the industry one, industry like the uh, construction one, with low uh, margins of profit, BIM is a necessity. Plus, second reason from efficiency perspective, second reason in Dubai, for instance, above certain size of a project, BIM is a legal requirement. And many, in many other countries, it is a legal requirement. Third, and most importantly, if you're doing any digitization, like 3D printing or whatever, BIM is a prerequisite. So, there are, uh, so even before COVID-19, for large projects uh, that we operate and many of the leaders here operate, I don't think BIM is a choice. BIM is a necessity. Okay, so we had, I was going to ask a question about, uh, I'll try and maybe if we can, they're not particularly related, but I was going to ask one more question, but I've just seen a, a really good question come in as well. Uh, I wanted to ask about the introduction more of green technology. Uh, you know, will will that happen? Will, will coronavirus, will that speed up the introduction of green technology? Uh, I mean, you mentioned earlier, or somebody, I can't remember who mentioned about uh, the construction industry. I think it was you, Arish, uh, yep. not being, you know, very sustainable. We know that concrete, for instance, is, is one of the key uh, reasons here. Um, or a key reason. Um, so is it going to speed up? And then the, the final question, so if people could just leap into these, and then the final question will be, uh, is, there a, is there software that can track assets such as hand tools that might help uh, us to understand how to reduce the number of people on site during a set period? So sustainability and let, then- let, let me answer quickly sustainability. I'll leave the second one for whoever, Rob. Uh, 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 my worry that the uh, post-COVID-19 will play negative 
uh, impact over uh, over sustainability. This is why I mention it, and 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 unless leaders in the world takes uh, takes this very seriously, for instance, uh, uh, Germany the other day announced that many stimulus package uh, post COVID nineteen will be will will have stricter sustainability uh, uh, requirement. So unless it starts with the regulatories and uh, uh, leaders' commitments like companies like ours, uh, uh, unfortunately, COVID-19 might play a negative uh, impact on, on sustainability. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, and, uh, and, and as far as the as far as the tool question, if, if I could jump in, uh, we, we've been we've been investigating different um, different applications, different technologies in order to track cool assets. Um, the latest craze has been around uh, Bluetooth uh, low energy devices that are placed either within the tool itself or 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 tagged onto the tool, and then they're they're tracked via different um, anchors and gateways across the project, which gives you a feel for. Uh, where the tool has moved, who's it, who you know, you can actually assign it to a person if you've got the system in place in order to do that. So it gives you a feel of um, of of where that tool has been, who's touched the tool, um, and it gives you a, a, an understanding of how is that tool being utilized. If if, if you you know, you're, I'm not saying that you're tracking it continuously, but if it if it hasn't if it hasn't touched a uh, an anchor or a gateway in recent times, it's probably more than likely sitting in somebody's. Uh, um, uh, uh, toolbox and, and hasn't been utilized. So there's definitely uh, uh, companies out there. Hilti is, is is one of the leaders in this, as well as Stanley Black and Decker. We've been uh, they've been investigating solutions from from both companies with the Wall Tool in the U.S. Okay, thank you, Rob. Just to add to tool tracking at Alec, we have uh, able to leverage uh, Hilti across all our tool tracking. Uh, from the central store across all project stores. And in addition to that, once it reaches the project store, we need to issue the tools to different employees. And for that, we have created a mobile app in order to do issue tracking to employees where they do issue and then they bring back the tool back to the store. So for us, it was fully automated using Hilti and a custom developed mobile app in order to do the full issuing and tracking. Okay, great. Thank you. And thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's been a really interesting conversation, actually, and I think one where we could have continued, but obviously uh, we've run over time, actually. Uh, but really thoughtful, insightful, interesting comments. And I think a lot of stuff here, actually, that we can probably return to in the future. As I said at the beginning, this is the first in our series of webinars that we'll be looking at uh, digital construction, construction technology. So I, I think you've laid the groundwork for, for our, our future webinars, which is fantastic. We also want to announce the dates for our next physical event, the Construction Technology Forum uh, in the UAE. That will take place in Dubai on the 23rd, 24th of February in, well, 2021 now. For the first time, CTF will also include the Construction Technology Awards, which will take place on the second day, on the 24th. These are a set of awards, I can see that they're now being shown on screen, a set of awards that we really want to be able to celebrate and highlight good use of technology in the sector. Uh, but we're, we're really excited to be all, uh, announcing these and we hope that you are too uh, for entering them. So with that, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time and we hope you found it interesting and useful.